Hello, my name is Henry Silverman, and today I will discuss developing an approach with patients or families who request medically futile treatments. There is a rich history in medicine regarding futility. For example, Hippocrates stated, there are three major goals of medicine, cure, relief of suffering, and refusal to treat those who are overmastered by their diseases, realizing that in such cases, medicine is powerless. Plato added his words of wisdom and said, to attempt futile treatment is to display an ignorance that is ally to madness. In the beginning, medicine was governed mainly by the ethical principles of beneficence, do only good, and non-maleficence, do no harm. These principles, combined by a paternalistic approach to medicine, ensured that the issue of medical futility was rarely controversial. However, the principle of autonomy began to become a paramount principle in medical practice. As early as 1859, moral philosophy gave expression to this principle via the writings of John Stuart Mill. Specifically, in his treatise entitled On Liberty, where he stated, over himself, over his body and mind, the individual is sovereign, unless his actions cause harm to others. Autonomy also found a place in legal proceedings, as in 1891, the U.S. Supreme Court held, no right is held more sacred or is more carefully guarded by the common law than the right of every individual to the possession and control of his own person. In the 1980s, one started to witness a shift towards autonomy, when patients and families began demanding that everything be done, even those treatments that might be medically futile. However, are there limits to autonomy? The principle of patient autonomy does not stand alone. Beneficence and non-maleficence requires that treatment be halted or withheld if it's in the physician's judgment that curative treatment will not benefit the patient or may cause harm. But how does one define benefit and how does one define harm? Similarly, there is no widely accepted definition for the term medical futility. Indeed, there are different notions of futility. For example, there is physiologic futility, which refers to treatment that will not achieve a physiologic goal. There is also qualitative futility, which refers to treatment that will not achieve a certain quality of a life that is acceptable to the patient. And then there is imminent demise futility, where, in spite of an intervention, the patient will die in the near future. But what time frame is specified when we say a treatment will not achieve a physiologic goal? Also, how does one define quality of life? And finally, how do we define the near future? Essentially, definitions are value-laden. Values define what is an acceptable probability of success, and values also define what is meant by an acceptable quality of life. Essentially, who should determine what treatment is futile when the probability of achieving a physiologic goal is low? Who should determine the appropriate level of chance for success, the patient or the physician? And finally, who should determine when a certain quality of life is not worth living? Also, frequently there are disagreements with prognosis between families and the healthcare team. One study looked at the prevalence and factors related to discordance about prognosis between physicians and surrogates and showed that many surrogates had beliefs about the prognosis that were more optimistic than that of the physician. The most common reason for optimism included a need to maintain hope to benefit the patient, a belief that the patient had unique strengths unknown to the physician, and a religious belief whereby only God knows when a patient will die. Indeed, it is quite difficult for a physician to refute these reasons for optimism. The essential task is how to balance the lack of effectiveness of a treatment against whatever benefit a treatment might have, and also how to balance it against the burdens that a treatment might present. Burdens measured in terms of harms to the patient, but also burdens in terms of moral distress to families if treatment is discontinued, and also moral distress to the caregivers when treatment is continued. 
Instead of trying to define futility, one can develop a process-based determination of futility. The American Medical Association Guidelines of Medical Futility recommends a process-based approach to me medical futility disputes. Also, the Texas Advanced Directive Act describes such a medical futility process. There are several benefits of a process-based medical futility policy. First, an effective conflict resolution approach permits all parties to arise at a consensus. It also allows for transfer if a con consensus cannot be reached. Also, it creates a fair process and greater consistency in handling medical futility cases. And it's more defensible than no process at all. However, does it lead to a fair process for all? There are certain risks of a process-based policy. First, there is no universally accepted definition of medical futility, thereby permitting inconsistent results between cases. There is no opportunity for an appeal for family members. There are also an inherent conflict of interest between the healthcare facility and its ethics committee. And the patient family is not really an equal partner in the negotiating process due to the inherent power imbalance between families and the healthcare team. There are, however, alternative approaches. One can use an informed non-dissent or an informed assent process that involves the physicians providing information as to why treatments will not be offered. And rather than asking for consent from the family, one is offering the family the choice to defer to clinicians' judgment about withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining therapy. Such an approach relieves emotional burdens on the family. But such an approach requires that such discussions occur in a non-coercive -co manner, and also one should develop a communication approach that is able to determine the role that the family members want to play in such decisions. Most families may be comfortable with an assent to defer approach, but some might not in which case it is best not to refuse such objections or else such an approach can backfire. Alternatively, if a treatment with low benefits is causing or is expected to cause pain and suffering, for example, continued electrical shocking in a patient with an unstable heart rhythm or dialysis that causes hypertension, one stands on firm moral grounds backed by the principle of non-maleficence or do no harm not to offer such treatment. Alternatively, rather than trying to predict when treatment will be futile, if there is already evidence that a treatment has not worked, then one should be obligated to discontinue such treatments. For example, a patient with end-stage liver disease who is not on the transplant list and experiences a non-treatable GI bleed and is consuming multiple blood transfusions, then one should be able to tell the family that such transfusions will be discontinued. Finally, physicians should advocate with the family a plan that involves a no escalation of treatment in the setting of continued clinical deterioration. So to conclude, Many conflicts between healthcare providers and patients or families arise due to a lack of communications resulting in a loss of trust. One should build trust by frequent communications and honest disclosures from the moment of admission. Invoking a medical futility policy should be a last resort. Thank you very much.